Okay, folks, I think we should uh, get started now. Um, welcome to you all. It's a great pleasure to see you here for this event that is uh, being co-sponsored by the Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences here at Queen Mary and by the Stuart Hall uh, Foundation. Uh, my name's Kim Hutchings. I'll just say a few introductory words um, and then I'll hand over to Gilan Taradros just to say a few words around the Stuart Hall Foundation before we get to the main event, uh, which is, of course, uh, Professor Michael Waltz uh, speaking. Um, so a very warm welcome to all of you, particularly to anybody who hasn't been to Queen Mary before tonight. Uh, the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences is aiming really to bring together the very best of interdisciplinary scholarship at Queen Mary and beyond. And it's great to be co-hosting tonight's event. I want to extend a special thanks and welcome to Professor Walter uh, for coming here to speak to us. It's a, a huge honor uh, to have him here. Um, his work, as you know, so many of you will know, um, touches a chord with a lot of the things that we're concerned about here at Queen Mary, from his writings on justice and politics to his commitment to an engaged form of scholarship and his contributions to public debate. Now, uh, some of you may have noticed, as advertised, we were also looking forward to welcoming Paul Lewis from the Guardian's New Populism programme. Uh, but as it turns out, Paul is having a baby. His wife's gone into early labour, so he's not able to join us uh, tonight. Um, so that, that gives Michael a little bit more scope to elaborate any remarks he might like to elaborate on and gives us more opportunity to debate uh, and discuss uh, the issues. Uh, so it leaves us with more time to, to listen to Michael, to hear what he has to say. Um, in discussing the present politics, uh, Michael once quoted Yeats when he said, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. And one could say the same thing of running orders of um, events. But perhaps some new ideas will be born tonight, uh, as well as, as things sometimes not quite working out as you expect. In anticipation, therefore, of a fascinating evening, and in order to keep the discussion going, uh, we invite you all to drinks afterwards so you can continue to probe um, what we've been investigating. So I'll now hand over to Jelen Tawadros, who will say something about the Stuart Hall Foundation, the co-sponsor of tonight's event. Or oh, I should say, actually, this event is being live streamed, so just to let you know that. Thank you, Kimberly, and thank you very much for chairing tonight's discussion. My name is Jelaine Tadros. I'm the chair of the Stuart Hall Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you all here to tonight's conversation. Conversation and dialogue was very much a hallmark of Stuart's way of engaging and thinking with others, and we hope that tonight will be just such an occasion to think together. Um, for those of you who don't know about the foundation, we're a young charity that was established five years ago by Stuart's family and friends to build on Stuart's extraordinary legacy. Um, he was one of the most important public intellectuals that this country has produced. Also a teacher and educator, a godfather of the black arts movement here in the UK, and someone who is involved in politics at every level. And these, these interests, these overlapping spheres of activity and engagement were all interconnected for Stuart, and they were a means for him uh, to explore something which is a continuous thread through his work, which is how do you probe, how do you understand in a profound and nuanced way the conjuncture we're in, the particular moment that we're experiencing. And I don't think a day's gone by in the last three or four years when I haven't wondered or wanted to engage Stuart in a conversation about this current conjuncture and what it means um, and how perhaps we missed the signs that maybe Stuart would have spotted um, about how we've come to this current moment. But I'm looking forward very much to the conversation tonight and just want to say a few brief thanks. Thanks to Paul Lewis, who I know was prepared for this event and, and, as Kim said, can't be here today. To Queen Mary University for co-hosting tonight. To Dr. Simon Reed Henry, Director of the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, who's 
helped make this possible, and Sophia Kasana, who's Executive Officer for the Myland Institute, June Reed from Queen Mary, who helped us tonight, to Harriet Florio, who's Office and Project Manager at the Foundation, and to the trustees, Michael and Susanna Rustin, who uh, first approached Michael and uh, secured his agreement um, to, to participate. And finally, to um, Bansenka Kamiemi from Naked Politics, who, if you haven't seen it, has done a wonderful interview with Michael. And thank you, Kimberly, for chairing, but uh, the hugest thanks uh, to you, Michael. You've just flown in today. Adverse travel conditions, as I understand, but it's a real honor and a privilege to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm very glad to be here and very grateful to the two sponsors of, um, of this event. Uh, I'm going to talk about American politics today, sticking to what I know best. Um, but since Paul Lewis isn't here, I hope that in the discussion, some of you will say something about authoritarian populism in this country. And perhaps some of you also can talk about uh, the continent. Um, so I will be talking about America, but I want to start from what Stuart Hall said in 1979 in a wonderful essay called The Great Moving Right Show about authoritarian populism and social democracy. It's interesting to imagine Margaret Thatcher, who, that's who he was writing about, as an early authoritarian populist. Uh, times have changed, and I guess the species has gone into the decline um, it may be parochial of me, but I do believe that our ignorant, corrupt, reckless, narcissistic president represents a low point in, uh, in the history of um, authoritarian populism. But I want to focus on one part of Stewart's essay, not what he said about Thatcherism, but what he said about social democracy, since I think of myself as a, as a social democrat. Stuart wrote about social democracy playing what he called a natural part in the rise of figures like Margaret Thatcher, a part defined by the central contradiction of social democratic politics. Um, and his account of the, of the contradiction is nuanced. Mine will be very quick. Uh, it's a contradiction between the electoral role of social democracy as representative of the working class and the governing role of social democracy as rescuer of capitalism. So I recognize the roles um, Obama our President Obama played the second in pretty much the way Stuart describes, using the interventionist state for the rescue and opening the way for an anti-statist populism. But I want to deny that the two roles have only one natural form. In the United States in the 1930s and here, after 1945, rescuing capitalism turned out to be consistent with a very strong program of social reform. Beginning in the late 1970s, there was a very specific failure of social democratic or center-left politics. And again, I'll be talking about the United States, um, where the Democratic Party represents a very weak version of that politics, but it's the best that we've been able to do. There were a lot of good social Democrats who were critical of Obama's economic policy in 2009 when he did rescue American capitalism. 
and who were critical earlier on of Clinton's third way, a phrase used to describe and sometimes to boast about a retreat from the center left to the center, the end of welfare as we know it, in Clinton's words. The policies that we were criticizing, which we didn't think natural to social democracy, had a result that we only partially anticipated. And I want to describe that result with a tale of two cities. I grew up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a steel town in the 1940s and early 50s when I lived there. Beginning in 1941, it was also a union town. The city had been a Republican stronghold dominated by Bethlehem Steel. But after the steel workers voted four to one for the steel workers organizing committee, it became firmly democratic. I remember Harry Truman speaking from the back of a railway car in 1948. He carried the city by a large margin. Today, Johnstown is a Rust Belt city. The mills are closed. The population is about two thirds of what it was in the 1940s. These days, I live in Princeton, New Jersey, a university town which is also home to many well-to-do doctors and lawyers and to a significant group of bankers and brokers who commute every day to New York. Princeton is not in the top 10 of America's richest cities, but it's up there. These two cities provide a telling account of the 2016 presidential election. Johnstown voted for Trump by a two to one margin. Princeton voted for Hillary Clinton by an eight to one margin. Amazing, eight to one margin. Yeah, that's not the way it used to be. And it's not the way our old theories about class politics told us that it should be. The social base of the Democratic Party right now consists of well-educated professional men and women, a disproportionate number of women generally, and a strongly motivated but not sufficiently mobilized coalition of American minorities chiefly Blacks and Hispanics. Together, these groups could make an electoral majority, but in practice, they do that only half the time in presidential elections and much less often in state and local elections. We have been doing, until 2018, very badly in state and local elections. The old industrial working class is no longer the major presence in the Democratic Party that it once was. Even its unionized fragments are not fully reliable Democratic voters. How, how did this happen? Uh, I don't believe in monocausal explanations. Any full response to that question would have to include many factors, but I. I'm going to emphasize one. Over the last four or five decades, social democratic parties and politicians abandoned social democratic politics. <coughs> In the United States, the New Deal Democrats forgot the New Deal. They failed to listen to, they failed to look after their own people their natural constituency, working class men and women, suddenly vulnerable in a globalizing economy. You could say that they gave up one side of Stewart's contradiction. They became less contradictory. The decline of the unions in the United States, the radical decline of the unions is a key sign <clears throat> a key sign of center-left failure. It obviously has economic and technological causes, deindustrialization and automation, 
but it also has political causes. There has been an effective right-wing and corporate campaign against the existing unions and against unionization wherever it has been attempted. In, for example, in Japanese-owned automobile plants in the American South or throughout the service industries. A campaign aided and abetted by the economic ideology called neoliberalism. Social Democrats and American liberals failed to engage this ideology. Instead, they adopted it. And they governed when they governed in accordance with its strictures and in alliance with important sections of capital, especially finance capital. They failed to regulate the banks. They allowed hundreds of thousands of home foreclosures after the recession of 08. They pursued trade agreements that didn't protect workers at home or abroad. They refused to use state power to promote unionization. They presided over a radical increase in inequality. They pursued growth over justice, claiming that growth would help everyone. And they refused to change their policies when it was clear that that wasn't happening. Instead, neoliberal economics and the accompanying politics helped, helped, there were other causes, but helped to create a new and highly vulnerable working class. We call it the precariat because the members of this class live extremely precarious lives. They are mostly, they mostly have jobs, but these are the new jobs of a post-industrial and non-union age. They are often part-time, temporary, insecure, low-paying, without benefits or with minimum benefits, and everywhere without union protection. Workers trapped in jobs like these in depressed cities like Johnstown are angry and resentful. They feel, I think, justifiably that they have been abandoned by the politicians who claim, who always claimed to be their protectors. A populist attack on elites resonates with them. But these democratic politicians, these American center-left politicians, have not become right-wing politicians. They are the supporters, sometimes a little slow to come around, but supporters still of racial and sexual minorities and of feminism, which is, I think, the most successful social movement of recent decades. They defend abortion, they defend gay marriage, they defend affirmative action. They are focused on what are called social issues. And on these issues, they are good egalitarians. And the bourgeoisie of Princeton, New Jersey loves them. Activists in these social movements have won victories, always incomplete, radically incomplete, less than we hoped for, but they have changed American society. The United States today is a better place for black Americans than it has ever been. Women are a much larger presence in the professions, in law and medicine, in corporate management at every level, and in politics. Gay marriage today is widely accepted. It often seems wildly popular. All this took the hard work of movement militants, but it is today the politics of the Democratic Party. And yet, in the years that these victories were being won, these egalitarian victories, 
the United States became an increasingly unequal society. And that's something that we need to think about and I think worry about. It appears that capitalism can take in blacks and women at every level of the established hierarchies and still be capitalism. Our economic rulers practice discrimination less, but exploitation no less. Indeed, the hierarchies have gotten steeper and may be easier to defend because they are less discriminatory. Now, this is something that we didn't expect. Most, most people, I think, on the left, we have often said that capitalism is inherently patriarchal and racist. Well, capitalism is, in the West, in America, historically patriarchal and racist but not inherently. We, we are now discovering that the logic of capitalism allows the incorporation of minorities. Not yet in proportion, of, uh, women very close are beginning to be close to proportionate positions in the professions they are not there yet in corporate management, but there are now women at every level of corporate management. Blacks lagging behind, but still moving into positions where they never were before. And yet, America is less <coughs> equal, less, more unequal than it has ever been. So we need, we need to think about how, how that has happened. Um, now, the men and women at or near the bottom of the hierarchies, or those who feel themselves falling, they are the members of the precariat. Many of them are black, many are women, but these aren't the blacks or the women who benefited from the victories of the social movements. They are the ones who were left behind. Black Americans stuck with the Democrats in 2016, as did the poorest of the poor, who don't, however, vote in large numbers. But a lot of the white women, along with their men, voted for Donald Trump. This was especially clear in poor rural areas and in Rust Belt cities like Johnstown and across the Midwest. Hillary lost the election in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Wisconsin. So in the United States today, leftists and liberals are arguing about whether the focus of our politics should be on identity politics, which is shorthand for the social issues, or on class. But this isn't a possible choice for the left. We cannot give up the fight for racial and gender equality which still has a way to go. We cannot give up that fight, or now the fight for the inclusion of immigrants. But we must, at the same time, return to the politics that we abandoned, the politics of class. It appears that two of the leading Democratic candidates have gotten this message. Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are promoting large-scale redistributive policies, high taxes on the richest Americans, tough corporate and financial regulation, and a major reconstruction of the welfare state. I'm happy to support these policies, but together they have not yet produced the politics that we need. Sanders and Warren represent a version of left populism, which is not the same as social democracy. They have not coordinated the policies they advocate with what uh, 
what there is of the labor movement. With the largest and most active of the existing unions, the service workers, the teachers, and the auto workers who are now on strike. I think they have just won a, a month long strike. Um, and the members of these unions are not enthusiastic about Warren and Bernie's Medicare for all, since they have won through difficult strikes and tough negotiations, they have won health care for the members of these unions that is better than Medicare. And there was never any consultation um, between Warren and Sanders and these uh, unions. Sanders has, late in the day, come out with a very strong program for the state promotion of unionization. Uh, I think it's the direct product of the steel workers, uh, the, the auto workers strike but it wasn't part of his original program. There is no, at the present time, there is no social movement behind these two left candidacies. Nor is there a political party committed to their proposals. The, 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 the Democrats in Congress, in the House and the Senate, and the Democrats who will be running for Congress in 2020, in their large majority, are committed to proposals considerably to the right of Sanders and Warren. So they have, the, they have support in the country. They have support in the remarkably rejuvenated organization uh, called the Democratic Socialists of America which in the last two years has grown from 8,000 members to 60,000 members and has officially endorsed Bernie Sanders. And many of its members, I'm afraid, are threatening not to vote for Elizabeth Warren, which is an example of the kind of left sectarianism that we, we do not need. So they, they have support in the country especially among young people, but this is still a support focused on them. Now, th they are not aspiring maximal leaders. They're not that kind of populist, but there is still a personalist politics. And even if the person wins, and Warren now seems the strongest candidate, even if she wins, I don't believe that you will be able to carry through a, co a coherent program of social reconstruction because we have not built a movement that, that can generate strong support for such a program. Uh, I want to end with a, a last worry about recent center-left politics in my country, and you can tell me whether it's anything to worry about here. One of the reasons for the alienation of many vulnerable or troubled Americans, especially white Americans, from the Democratic Party and from any farther leftism is their belief that they are now the people who are marginalized and degraded, that the elites who defend all the minorities hold them in contempt. It's, it's hard to judge the importance of this belief relative, say, to the declining standard of living of these same people, which is probably much more important. But the belief is uncomfortably true. I'm going to give just one example. The, the causal role of contempt is less important than the simple fact <coughs> that it exists. For leftists now and always, contempt for those who stand to our right is neither politically wise nor morally right. So, Tell Me How It Ends is a recent book published last year by a woman named Valerie Luzelli. Um, and it is, as the blurbs say, and they are right, 
a brave and eloquent critique of American immigration policies. It has gotten a strong reception for its author's clear-eyed intelligence and marvelous literary imagination. And the book is indeed a persuasive critique of political positions, policies that obviously need criticism, in fact, need savage criticism. But please listen to one passage. Luzelli is commenting on a newspaper picture of Thelma and Don Christie <clears throat> of Tucson, Arizona, who are protesting <clears throat> against the arrival of undocumented immigrants. And this is what she says. I zoom in on their faces and wonder what passed through the minds of Thelma and Don Christie when they prepared their protest signs. Did they pencil in protest against illegal immigrants on their calendars right next to mass and just before bingo? A friend read me those sentences and said, that's why Hillary lost the election. Well, not the only reason, but my friend had a point. We can't build a democratic politics of solidarity with attitudes like that. And attitudes like that are fairly common among the intellectual elite and even among men and women who think of themselves as leftist militants, as Luzelli certainly does, rightly does. We always insist on our commitment to the inclusion of the others. On the American left, othering is a social and political crime. But we need to think carefully about how we should relate to the others whom we have helped to create. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Michael. Really thought-provoking, um, a very interesting talk, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of comments and questions coming. Um, I, I had a sort of set of things I wanted to ask you about, but I was actually just really fascinated by the way you ended, and the whole issue of contempt. And I guess the relationship between morality and politics, in some sense, there. Um, it, is this new, though, or has this simply always been the way that people are? Is there something new happening in terms of how opponents are being constructed within the political realm, or is this just business as usual in some ways, do you think? Um, well, there has, there has always been an American um, elite culture which had a certain view of the people called white trash, um, hillbillies. Um, and although I don't know the terms that were used, the evangelical Christians. But, but these people didn't play a significant part in American politics. So the, the discourse about them was, um, uh, a popular culture discourse. You, you could see it in the movies or on television or in old, the radio that I grew up in. But, and it went along with jokes about every other ethnic group. <clears throat> um, but w what has happened in recent years is that, that this group of, um, of vulnerable people has not only grown, but it has entered politics. It has, been, it, it has been mobilized for politics by people like Donald Trump. Um, I think most 
American liberals, leftists, watching a Trump rally would feel complete. It's incomprehensible. Who are these people? Where did they come from? We never saw them before. Um, and, and they are, they are a, a powerful presence. And, <clears throat> and what is funny about them is that, that their entrance into politics has come over time, and a great many of them voted for Obama. So you can't simply call them racist. <clears throat> um, and if you talk to, we do have liberal left journalists who are now trying to talk to these people and write about them. Um, and if you talk to them, many of them say, well, they voted for Donald Trump, but their second choice was Bernie Sanders. And there are people who supported Bernie Sanders against Hillary Clinton who say their second choice was Donald Trump. So there is something going on that we need to understand. And Luizelli's way of understanding it is exactly wrong. It just dismisses it rather than trying to understand it. So it's, I mean, there are interesting parallels there, certainly with here, I think, in terms of um, you know, the famous Brexit vote and the ways in which people from both the left and the right rummage around that, but also people swap. And they're a threat to both Conservative and Labour um, you know, constituencies in elections and so on. Can I ask you a bit more about the sort of the failure, in a sense, that you're pointing to of the political class or the political leader of the Democratic Party over a period of years? I mean, can you, do you see a particular point in time where that really starts to turn? Is it to do with the 80s and the sort of Reaganomics and that, that point? Or is it a later historical point you see as crucial? Well, it's, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure that its origins are economic. Um, so let me tell uh, a story. In um, 1967, during the anti-Vietnam War movement, I was part of a group of people in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I was teaching at Harvard then. Um, who organized, who formed what we called um, the Cambridge Neighborhood Committee on Vietnam. And we were doing SDS type community organizing against the war, meaning we were knocking on doors and looking for someone who would give us a living room where we could organize a block meeting. And we were doing that kind of organizing in Cambridge. And we um, decided that you needed um, a focus. And so we, we managed to get a, to get a, 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 managed to organize a referendum on the war in the city of Cambridge by putting on the ballot a call for a one day citywide rally sponsored by the city against the war. And we came, and then we were able to knock on doors and we were soliciting votes for this, um, for, this, uh, for this motion. And um, we got 40% of the city to vote against the war, um, which was not bad considering that American soldiers were dying in Vietnam. We lost every working class neighborhood in Cambridge. We carried Harvard Square and the surround. Um, we carried, we won the support of the same people, the same kind of people who voted for Hillary Clinton in Princeton, New Jersey. And we lost the support of many of the people who voted for Donald Trump, although in 1967, they still had good jobs. And it's easy to see what happened? Um, we were sending college students to knock on, who were exempt from the draft, to knock on the doors of people whose kids were in Vietnam. Um, so 
it wasn't a, a winning formula. And the, the, result, the, result, the result was a shock to, to, to many of the lefties because a, a sociology graduate student did a study of the vote. The higher the rent you pay, the greater the value of your home, the more likely you were to vote against the war. So right there in 1967, we were already in a situation something like what we're in now. Um, and I think we have to recognize that many, many parts of the working class, the white ethnic working class, is conservative on the social issues which we promoted and, and had to promote. I mean, it was the right thing to do in the 70s and 80s. Um, and so just as they were patriotic and thought we weren't, so they thought we were radical feminists and um, in, before gay marriage became popular, it was, uh, it was, a, it was anathema to many. Um, Catholic and evangelical Protestant working class people. Um, and we didn't know how to, how to, and, and yet, if you think about it, women and blacks and Hispanics make up a, a majority, a pretty big majority of the working class. So we, yeah. <laughs> we have a lot to think about in um, how we, we do our politics. Yeah, I mean, that's um, uh, a really good point because in your presentation, you were sort of talking about the need for, for a movement, but also talking about how, for want of a better word, identity politics issues or whatever are not necessarily or should not be lined up against class politics, as it were. But somewhere along the line, there seems to become this kind of assumption that there is there has to be a, a, a division between them. Well, it's a, it, it is a, one of those left-wing fights that probably isn't necessary, um, but is fought with great zeal. Should we stress the social issues? Um, because after all, um, the white working class that we are abandoning is on its way to becoming a, a minority in America, and and Hispanics, Blacks, women together are a large majority. So why isn't that politics? And that was Hillary's politics. That was Hillary's politics, <coughs> and she she won by three million votes and lost by a thousand small cuts. Yeah. You know, if more of Bernie Sanders supporters had voted for her in three states, she would have won. If the black turnout for her had been like it was for Obama, she would have won. If the FBI hadn't relaunched, oh, she would have won. <laughs> so there's a case to be made that that kind of politics is just says, we don't have to go to Johnstown, Pennsylvania. That's lost. That's lost territory. I think that's wrong, and it's wrong because of what the left is, not just because it's strategically wrong. It's wrong because those are people that we have to have some relationship to, even if it's a critical relationship or, or a critical engagement. Um, what do you think? is likely to happen now in terms of left politics. I mean, you talk about what was happening in the Democratic Party at the moment and the next election, and more broadly, the phenomenon of populism. I mean, is it likely to be a left populist group that ends up coming through if anything? Well, we're, we're right now, Elizabeth Warren is running the smartest and the most disciplined political campaign that we have seen in quite a while. <clears throat> Um, and I think she is on the way to winning the Democratic nomination. And um, I, I uh, she, well, she hasn't said she said hardly a word about foreign policy. And this is a this is one of the problems. They are running these Bernie and and 
Elizabeth Warren are running to be the, the, the leader of the global hegemon, and they have almost nothing to say about <coughs> foreign policy. I, that's a problem. But if you just listen to Elizabeth on domestic policy, she sounds very good. Um, <laughs> but we know, given what the Democratic Party is actually like on the ground, that even if the Democrats win the Senate and hold the House, she will not be able to get her program, or almost any part of her program, through Congress without major compromises. And she is creating a young constituency of people who will shout sell out when she makes those compromises. Mm -hmm. So there is a there is a, a there is a problem. And um, it's the kind of problem that is solved by political parties and social movements where these issues are worked out in, in larger groups than in than by one candidate and a few of her academic advisors. And, and we don't have a, a social movement right now of, of, of that kind in the United States. Okay, thanks for that, Michael. I think perhaps it's time for me to throw this open um, to the audience. So if people like to raise their hands, okay, we're getting several. So we've got one there, one there, and then somebody right up at the back. Uh, Harry, do you want to start with the second row? Uh, Why not you ask him to come down? Yeah, you could perhaps come down if you can ask a question. <laughs> okay, Harry, you go, you go ahead while the other person yeah. comes down. Yeah, I'm going to go. Well, thank you very, very, very much. It's, uh, it was a pleasure to, to listen uh, to this speech. Um, so I'll try to keep my points uh, as quick as possible. First, um, you managed to get through the whole analysis without mentioning the G word, globalization. Um, although it seems to me that was so pivotal in the sorts of changes that Bill Clinton and Tony Blair represented, right? The, uh, the constant insistence that uh, the left or right, um, had to show financial competence, had to know how to read a balance sheet, but above all had to compete in a very different global economy, right, where states did not have this kind of autonomy that they enjoyed in earlier decades. Um, and then, so I'm curious about how that kind of pressure of globalization uh, uh, might put a break on some of, of some of what you're urging, a kind of return to a more traditional kind of social democracy. Um, second, um, uh, Elizabeth Warren on foreign policy, um, isn't it true that she's largely looking at people who she thinks will vote in their pocketbooks, who don't really worry that much about foreign policy? Um, again, it isn't foreign policy more of a concern of Princeton and Harvard Square? Right? Um, and so maybe she's making a, a calculation there along the lines that you've been pointing out. Um, and then finally, uh, <laughs> and then finally, um, um, I, was, I, I, found, I, I found fascinating um, your idea about how um, capitalism actually uh, can uh, incorporate racial minorities, women, and so forth, contrary to earlier sort of, you know, more kind of more classically Marxist and <coughs> similar sort of models. I think, yeah, there's a lot to be said for that, but I mean, is it true to say that patriarchy is just a kind of a numbers game? When you get 50% 50, 50 men, 50% women, you overcome patriarchy. Is patriarchy really just about counting the heads of women? Or is it something more? Um, Okay, that's quite a lot. All right, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to go and collect some more, but I think because there were three there, we're going to give you a chance to answer them, and then we'll move on to the next two. So if you don't mind waiting. Well, um, yes, I think globalization did create a, um, a, an, an, economy, an economic situation which uh, the neoliberals thought they were addressing. Um, but let me. Once again, let me tell a, a, a story. Um, the, 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 the case that I know best is the Johnstown, Pennsylvania case. Um, the, 
Bethlehem Steel did not go out of business um, because of the, the recent globalization. They, they did not go out of business because of steel plants in Brazil or China. Uh, they went out of business because of steel plants in Germany. And the reason they went out of business because of steel plants in Germany was because the Germans, having watched the bombing of the country and the destruction of much of the um, economic industrial structure, they built a new steel industry with new technology. <laughs> Bethlehem Steel in Johnstown, Pennsylvania never invested in new technology. During the boom years, they simply took the money and divided it among their stockbrokers. So they, they, they could not compete. And they went out of business quite quickly once, once the Germans began producing more and better steel. Um, now, the US government should have noticed that something like that was going on. The, the, the U.S. government, certainly New Deal Democrats or Social Democrats, should have noticed, should have stressed the importance of investment in the economy for the sake of the American working class. And nobody, nobody was interested. Taking the money and running was what capitalists did. So I think there was a role for social democracy in, the, in um, what we now call globalization. And there was a role later on. There was a role to, to, to protect unions. Even the, the, the auto worker strike is a strike of 49,000 workers. That's, this is a union that had a couple of hundred thousand workers. Um, and one of the reasons it, for its decline is its inability to organize in the Japanese auto plants that are now all over the American South. And they can't organize in those plants because they don't have the support of the National Labor Relations Board, which was the, who came to Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 41 and forced a union election, which the steel workers won. Nobody is acting on behalf of this. The, the government is no longer acting on behalf of unionization. And unionization requires a legal framework. It requires support because the corporations can mobilize if there is no government intervention. Corporations can mobilize in ways that will always defeat the, the union. They can simply fire every union organizer and threaten the workers with moving the factory if they vote for the union, and nobody intervened. So there is much, there is much that could be, that could have been done, even in this kind of a country. <laughs> now, the other two So it was one of them when the foreign policy was an issue for the yes. election, of course, <coughs> the other one, um, patriarchy, and whether it's that yeah. head counting. Yes, well, um, <laughs> head counting is, is important um, I, I, I don't think that um, patriarchy is such a small part of our culture that it can be eliminated just by giving <coughs> it a better job obviously a lot more has to happen um, but it's very important to give women better jobs. <laughs> and it does change the character of, um, of capitalism. If women are, it doesn't change, <coughs> it doesn't change the, the, the character of capitalism in the sense that we thought capitalism was wrong. It doesn't change that at all. Women executives pursue profit in the same way that, that, that men have done. So that's important. <laughs> um, 
But as I said, all of the victories of the, so of the social movement have been radically incomplete. And we still have, that's why the people who say now we have to move to a straight class <coughs> politics are, are wrong. Um, what we have to do is find a way of combining the, the two. Foreign policy, well, yes, it's important to me. <laughs> um, and it should be important to you. You know, one of the things that the Brexiteers are promising you is that after um, you leave the EU, the United States is going to make a wonderful trade deal with you. Well, Donald Trump is going to screw you so the same way he screws anyone he can. <laughs> um, so it's important. It's important that there be a a different, a, a different kind of um, American foreign policy. Okay, um, we've got a couple of other questions that were waiting, so there's one down there and one up there. So perhaps if we take both of those and then... Uh... Hello. Um, in the run-up to the election next year, you mentioned that there's a social movement needed for Warren and uh, Sanders' economic policy, so the Medicare and the high tax on the rich. How do you think that this social movement can best be achieved successfully in the year, and assuming that they become presidents during their presidency as well. I didn't hear the last part. Okay, so he's really asking about what would be able to succeed the policy of high taxation. Let's put him on the spot and watch so we can make it happen. Um, hi, uh, I just want to say thank you. I had the pleasure of interviewing you earlier this week, Michael, uh, for my platform for young people, Naked Politics. And so it was really interesting to hear your uh, views about um, how young people can defeat uh, right-wing populism. I have two really quick questions. Um, one of them is about young people. Um, so firstly, I think a running theme throughout a lot of this is voter turnout, um, not just for young people, but across the board generally. Um, so my first question is, what do you think politicians or political movements should be doing to try and motivate particularly young people to vote? Because there's a huge deficit um, in terms of young people who can vote and those who actually do. Uh, and my second question is about money and wait. Oh, sorry. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got what would enable the uh, the uh, Sanders and the Warren kind of forces to work? What would enable them to do? So? And then this question about how can we get those turnout, encourage those turnout? Yeah, that was it. <laughs> okay. So. Um, yeah. So um, let me. Do you want to answer those two uh, first? Yeah. We'll come back. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, look, uh, 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 the, the United States is right now a radically unequal society. Um, corporate power is greater, I think, than it has ever been. Unions are weaker than they have been since the organizing of the late 30s and early 40s. Um, the, so we have a long way to go. Now, if there are beginning to be um, opinion polls in which large numbers of Americans say that they think socialism would be a good thing. Um, larger among people under 30, but still strikingly different from anything we have seen before. And, and what they mean is Bernie Sanders' socialism, which is really the New Deal, um, an, an updated <coughs> version of, um, of the New Deal. It is, it is social democracy of, um, of the kind that triumphed in, in, in much of Western Europe after World War II. Um, achieving that would be um, a, big, a big change in American life, though it wouldn't yet be socialism. Um, and I think that that should be our immediate goal. Um, and, but that, and that requires rebuilding the labor movement, 
and it requires taking over the Democratic Party, um, which means fighting local, for local lefty candidates around the country. And this has to be done with some sense of, 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 or, of, or, of what organization means. The old labor motto, organize, is something that um, we really have forgotten. Um, another story, during Occupy Wall Street, which was a lovely moment, but a brief moment, in American political history. Um, I visited Occupy Wall Street. It was the work of the young, and many of the young people associated with me at the set, at the magazine The Set, spent a lot of time down there. They would bring me on tours, but they, they spent a lot of time. Um, and they told me this story about a meeting of the General Assembly. Um, the General Assembly was a meeting of anyone who was there that day. And somebody stood up, this was late in the history of Occupy. Somebody stood up and said, look, our numbers are decreasing. We have to begin recruitment. And somebody else jumped up and said, recruitment? That's a fascist idea. <laughs> So with a movement like that, you don't have a movement. <laughs> um, there were no leaders because it was again, there were leaders, but there, everybody had to pretend that there were no leaders and no accountable leaders. And this again is an old story on the, on the left. Our, our, what we did with SDS organizing had this form. We would knock on doors, and, and we were looking for what we called community people. And the goal was to create an organization that was run by community people. Well, one of the most famous of the SDS organizations was the Newark SDS. Um, it was called the Newark Union Cooperative or something. And um, I visited it several times. Tom Hayden, who was one of the leaders of the SDS, you're not, but he couldn't be called the leader, but he was one of the leaders of the SDS, and was organizing in, um, it was called NCUP, the Newark Community Union Project. So I visited, and there was a meeting of the community, um, and it was run by community people up front. And Tom Hayden sat in the back. And everybody got a crick in their necks by looking back to get hints and clues as to what they could do. <laughs> and that's, again, not the way to run uh, a movement. So we need, we, need, we need people who are willing to, to deal with leaders to make them accountable. That's the important thing. Willing to accept the discipline of an organization um, and willing to sustain uh, their activity. When the police shut down Occupy Wall Street, it was over. There was no institutional remainder. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we have to avoid. Now, getting young people to vote is also one of the biggest questions in American politics right now. Historically, the 18 to 29 year old cohort votes in much, much lower numbers than any other cohort. And it's my age cohort which votes in the largest numbers, which is not a good thing, <laughs> not necessarily a good thing. Um, so, uh, what, what to do. And it was very clear in Bernie's 2016 campaign, where the, 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 the rallies, the turnout for his speeches was wonderful. And yet a very high percentage of the people who came to listen to him didn't register and didn't vote. 
And some of them who did register and vote refused to vote for Hillary. Okay. Um, now, in 2018, there was a jump, a, a significant jump, uh, from something like 19 or 21 percent to close to 40 percent of that age cohort voting. Um, and that's from this this time. I think it has a lot to do with with Sanders, but also still with with Bernie. Um, so. If, if you get them out to vote, then maybe you can also get them <coughs> into an organization. <laughs> um, and I think climate change is, is by far the most promising, um, the most pro the, it's an issue we, we have to address, and young people seem to be the people most motivated to address it. And, um, well, so that's it's up to you. Do you have another question that you wanted to? Uh, yeah, um, my second question was about um, money in politics. Um, not so much of a problem in the UK, but I think it's a huge problem in the US and is part of the reason why a lot of people are quite um, distrustful of politics in America. And I think it's something which crosses both the left and the right. Um, obviously, Donald Trump spoke a lot about, quote, draining the swamp, which of course he's never going to do. Um, but how key is it to defeating populism that the left take it seriously, have taking money out of American politics and putting it, making it democratic essentially again, not having all the power in the hands of, of rich people who can, who can play politics and, and decide what we like? I didn't hear most of that. Basically, that money in American politics and whether that needs to be taken to enable a properly democratic process. And one of the reasons I think distrusting politics is because of this. Um, uh, American politics is, um, has been for some time uh, dominated by uh, people with a lot of money who spend it on television ads um, and now on the social media. Um, I'm not sure, the, the, the left has always believed that numbers will outdo wealth, if only we organize the, the numbers. Um, Bernie Sanders is outraising everybody else, um, and he's not accepting any big money. It's all in small donations from, from um, people with we assume with modest income. Um, so it's possible to run a, a political campaign now um, against the wealthy, and that's what that's what a left populism would 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 do, and that's what um, Bernie and Elizabeth are both very very um, eager to describe. The, um, the damage done by the big insurance companies or the big um, um, communications uh, companies. Um, and it, 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 it seems to, to work. Now, I would still hope that a future Supreme Court, after a few people are replaced somehow, um, would would outlaw the um, extensive use of money in, Amer in American politics. I'm not against, I, I've always believed that one of the measures of commitment <laughs> is the willingness to contribute not only time and energy to a cause, but also money. So um, in the organizations that I, uh, the local, the small organizations, for example, the anti-war organization. I was very strongly in favor of bake sales and um, um, fairs where we sold things. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's a, a good idea to try to keep money entirely out of politics. 
to say that the campaign should be funded entirely by the state. Because if this is a way, I can't go to a meeting, but I'll give you five dollars. Um, and we 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 build support that that way. Um, we talk about money as the universal. Um, it, it, it converts into everything, um, and we certainly want it. Shouldn't convert into political power. But it can express political commitment. Um, if, we, if we regulate the, the size and scope of contribution. Michael, thank you so much. Really thought provoking talk. I wonder if part of the contempt that you were talking about earlier is also uh, an unwillingness to recognize that votes for Trump and Brexit are radical and revolutionary. Because Boris Johnson was quoted, I'm going to misquote him now, he was quoted recently, didn't he say something like, you can, people in this country, talking about the UK, have more influence on a game show like I'm a Celebrity than they do on their futures and, you know, parliament. And so I wonder if you could say something about that. Yes. Um, well, I, I, think, I think you're right that there is a, a very strong sense of disillusion with um, with the central institutions of democratic <coughs> politics. That they are not working in ways that um, engage people and reflect their influence, that allow them to think that they have influence. It, there, there, is, um, there are many studies that political scientists have done about what they call the sense of efficacy that, of citizens. Um, in, in the United States today, and perhaps in other um, democratic countries, the sense of efficacy among many citizens is, is much too low. They don't feel that, that people are listening. Um, and, but, but, but then why do they think that Donald Trump is, is listening? He, he, he expresses their feelings about the elites, that's what populists do. Um, he expresses their feelings. He, he tells them that he is going to work on their behalf, but then he doesn't. And it doesn't seem to change their view of him. Um, I, so I'm, I'm, I don't know how to, I mean, they should feel, that should make them feel even less effective that they have voted for this man who, who betrays them. Um, I don't know, how, how do we restore respect for the central institutions? Um, Congress, I think deservedly in America, has a very low reputation. Um, the Supreme Court still has fairly high respect. Um, I, I think the way to, the, this is the old fashioned left position. The way to make people feel efficacious is to produce, is to enlist them in organizations that are efficacious. But um, yes, and that's what we still have to do. Thank you very much.
that you mentioned foreign policy um, and the lack of interest apparently of those candidates Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, the apparent lack of interest in foreign policy. Um, here in the UK we have a radical left leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who is very interested in, in foreign policy and has a very long record of campaigning on foreign policy issues and many of his positions actually strangely have some commonality with those of Donald Trump, who's quite cool towards NATO, relatively warm towards Russia, very hostile towards foreign military intervention. And I know you've written on this subject, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that and what you think a social democratic foreign policy ought to look like. <laughs> well, actually, I, I published a book two years ago called A Foreign Policy for the Left. Um, and it's, um, it's, these issues are extremely controversial and, and divisive on the, on the left. And we saw that very clearly in um, Donald Trump's um, sudden decision to withdraw American troops from um, northern, north, west, northeastern Syria. Um, that, that withdrawal was opposed by all of the neocons and by most Democrats. Um, and it was supported on the left, the farther left, um, who believe in, um, well, the, the, who have uh, uh, formed a kind of alliance with the old isolationists. The old isolationists believe that American disengagement from the world would be good for America. And the left position is America's disengagement from the world would be good for the world. <laughs> um, and I, I, I doubt both of those. Propositions. I, I am a, um, a left, a sometimes interventionist. Um, and I think it's, um, it makes sense to think about particular American engagements or NATO engagements. To think about them one by one, case to case, very often we have to say no, but not always. Um, I think, for example, that um, the intervention in Kosovo was a justified intervention. Um, the uh, invasion of Iraq, I thought, was unjustified. Um, I oppose an American, I wrote a lot on the Descent website against an American intervention in Syria, um, partly because I thought that the people rebelling against a terrible dictatorship <coughs> didn't have enough popular support to win, and I don't believe that foreign armies should change things when there isn't popular support. I thought that the good guys, in the people who call themselves secular Democrats, they were really good guys, but, but there weren't a lot of them. And so I was against going in and supporting them because I didn't see any way of making them bringing them to rule Syria without, without um, a, a, an American army. Um, but the Kurds, I thought, when they agreed to fight with us against the caliphate, the ISIS caliphate, and when they formed a kind of autonomous zone in northern Syria, which was democratic, and, and um, I don't know how.
how this happened, but democratic and militantly feminist. Um, I thought that we should support them and that the, the, um, the American alliance with the Kurds should have had left support. Um, and I thought the betrayal of the Kurds was a, a terrible, a terrible betrayal. Um, sticking with the Kurds would also have given the United States a place at the table of the final peace conference, along with Russia and Iran. Um, and it was important to do that because we had two moral responsibilities. The, the people we called the good guys and didn't help are still there. Some of them are still the good guys. And it, we have to guarantee that they are not murdered when the Assad regime finally triumphs. And that's a responsibility. And we have to guarantee that the Kurds get some degree of autonomy consistent with their survival. Um, and those are responsibilities that only America can fulfill, or America with NATO allies. And so it, it seems to me we have to say yes and no. And, and um, too many people on the left want to say no all the time, and too many people on the right want to say yes all the time. And we need to think about each case. I would have supported an intervention in um, Darfur, in the Sudan. Not an American intervention, but an intervention by African states with American logistical support, which only we could have provided because there was a massacre going on. And massacres should not go on. They should be stopped. And anybody who can stop them should stop them. Um, I, I thought uh, when, the Viet, when the Vietnamese went into Cambodia to shut down the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge, that was a justified intervention. And if they hadn't been able to do it and the Chinese had done it, that would have also been a justifiable intervention, because what was going on was, was awful. Um, I thought the uh, Tanzanian intervention to overthrow Idi Amin in Uganda, the murderous regime of Idi Amin, was a good thing. And I like those cases precisely because they don't involve the big powers. They don't involve America. But sometimes America can do it. Sometimes. We can do good things in the world. In World War II, we did good things. Um, and so a, 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 a consistent anti-Americanism, a consistent argument for American disengagement is, I think, a bad, a bad position. And let me say just a word about Jeremy Corbyn's own opposition to NATO, which I don't know if he still is, I don't know what he says now, but when he was, um, an MP without power, he was strongly in favor of a British withdrawal from NATO. Now, how how do left how should leftists think about that? Well, I have leftist friends in Poland. There is a, a group of, of of people who are good secular militant leftists working very hard against in favor of immigration, against the current government, very good people. They would have been appalled and frightened by a British withdrawal from NATO. And it never occurred, I, I, I think, it never occurred to Jeremy Corbyn to talk to those people. But that's what, interna that's what left internationalism means. And I, I think, we, we need to, to, to realize that um, there are moments when organizations like NATO can, in fact, defend liberty. 
And when they can, and when they do, we should support them. And when they don't, we should be critics. Okay, so we've actually got three, um, well, maybe now four people coming in. Have we got time to do all of those? Yes, about ten minutes. Another ten minutes. Okay, so could we maybe take both of the questions there? I'll note them down, and then we'll take the question in the middle and the question on the page there. Hello. Um, you don't um, strike a particularly optimistic note, or at least. Um, what, what, if anything, it does give you cause for optimism that the social and um, the choice between social and economic can be avoided and that it can be aligned with a principled foreign policy? Okay, yeah, we'll take, I'll write it down and, and then um, just say yeah. Um, I was wondering whether the events of the last few years have in any way changed your view that the patriotic attachments of so many people are simply things which liberals should accept and live with, as opposed to trying to abolish over the long term somehow? Okay, so the first question is uh, about peace and sportism, and the second is whether... Did he suggest anything? No, he's not <laughs> <laughs> Optimism. Yes, of course, there are reasons for optimism. Um, uh, in the United States, uh, the Democratic Party won the House of Representatives, gained 40 seats <clears throat> in the 2018 election, and a lot of the winning candidates were um, minorities and women, more than ever before. Um, a lot of them ran on centrist not lefty platforms, but they were against Donald Trump. Um, and they are, they are in favor of maybe not Medicare for all, but a radically improved Obamacare, which is what most Americans right now probably favor. Um, so if you, if you win, you're optimistic and you, there is now a possibility of winning again in, uh, in 2020. Um, I'm, I'm a warrior, so uh, I'm not convinced that we will win. A lot of my friends think it's going to be a landslide against Donald Trump. I don't think that. But um, I do think it is, uh, it is <coughs> possible that we will win. And um, I'm told by some of my friends in the, um, in the SEIU, the Service Workers Union, um, that there is suddenly an influx of young people who want to be organizers. So that's a good thing. Um, and um, the Democratic <coughs> Socialists of America have grown, as I told you, from 8,000 to 60,000 in two years. And even though there are already sectarian battles among the 60,000, still, that doesn't help them. They are, they're there. Um, so about, about patriotism, um, I've, I've, I've been working on an essay, an, an essay which I call the adjective liberal. Uh, and it's inspired by two books, uh, a book by um, Carlo Roselli, the Italian anti-fascist militant leader who was assassinated by Mussolini's thugs in France in, um, in the middle, late 30s, who wrote a book called Liberal Socialism. 
and also by a book by a friend of mine, Yuli Tamir in Israel, who wrote a dissertation with Isaiah Berlin here at Oxford called Liberal Nationalism. So I think of myself as a liberal, liberal socialist and a liberal nationalist and a liberal communitarian. And, um, and I want, I'm trying to figure out what does the adjective mean? Because it, I think it does the same thing in each of those cases. Um, it, it, is, it constrains, if you think of, the, of liberal democracy, a liberal democracy is a democracy in which majority <coughs> cannot overturn civil liberties and human rights. That's a liberal democracy. There are constraints on majority rule in a liberal democracy. Um, liberal socialism is a pluralizing, the adjective has a pluralizing effect. There are, as, as Khrushchev said, there are many roads uh, to communism. So there are many roads to socialism. There are many different socialisms there. Are, um, and liberal socialism is, is, um, is a constraint on um, vanguard arrogance and vanguard presumption. Um, and liberal nationalism is, uh, is describes a nationalism that recognizes many nationalisms. And um, I and I am that kind of a of a nationalist. Um, I believe that the, the state, which in most of the world is the nation state, is right now, not always, not necessarily, but right now, the crucial instrument of collective action. It is the state that we try to take over in order to provide physical security and education and welfare and just distributive policy. It's the state and only the state that can do that. And therefore, I believe there should be everybody who needs a state should have one. And so I am a defender of, I, I grew up to be a defender of the Jewish state. I was a defender of the Armenian state. I believe there should be a Tibetan state and a Kurdish state and a Palestinian state. Um, everybody who needs a state. So there is a kind of nationalism which is international. 